Thanks for downloading from the School of Christ. Support for this program comes from your generous donations. To find out more, visit us online at www.theschoolofchrist.org. We come to John chapter 14, and for purposes of our study, I believe that we can divide John 14 into four distinct categories. Number one, my father's house. Number two, my father's works. Number three, my father's word. And number four, my father's help. And we will see Jesus going into each of these four categories here as we read in John 14. Bearing in mind where we are in this study of John, because when we began, um, we noted that John is especially interested in these signs and miracles and things that are done outwardly that point to Christ. And So everything we have read and studied and looked at in the life of Jesus so far has been mostly concerning outward things. Uh, Something happens, Jesus performs a miracle, whether it is uh, multiplying the loaves or raising Lazarus from the dead or changing the water into wine. There is some kind of a sign or a miracle that takes place. And then John uses this as a springboard to begin to take us into a spiritual truth. Well, that began to change last week when we were in John 13, where Jesus is there in the upper room and he is beginning to transition them away from the idea of an outward kingdom that they were expecting. And now the emphasis is shifting away from the public, away from the outward teaching and the outward signs and the miracles And he is now beginning to get them to consider the inward, the hidden, the spiritual reality. And so naturally, this created a bit of confusion among the disciples. At this point, Judas has already left. um, And we said, we made the observation last week that what Judas Judas was doing was, uh, yes, denying the Lord, yes, betraying the Lord, but most importantly, he's denying the work of the cross by refusing to take up the cross and to follow in the footsteps of the master. Jesus says, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And the example uh, was not merely the washing of their feet, but it was symbolic of his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And the spiritual principle is that to be his disciple, you must follow in his steps and embrace the cross. And that's something that Judas was not willing to do, had no desire to do. And part of his problem is he is looking and trying to bring to pass an outward kingdom. So he's, he thinks perhaps that by forcing Jesus into a confrontation with the religious leaders that Jesus will maybe uh, be more aggressive in the establishment of this earthly kingdom of Israel uh, as they expected their Messiah to behave. So we don't know entirely his motivation, that's just conjecture. But where we come to in John 14 is a place where Judas has left, and now Jesus begins to teach them the very highest that he can possibly convey to them. And yet he was limited in what he could teach them and what he could convey to them, not limited in himself, but limited by their inability, their lack of being able to comprehend the spiritual importance of what it was he was trying to get across to them. And part of the reason for that is 
because they did not have the Holy Spirit within them to give them the wisdom, to give them the understanding, to give them the discernment, to give them the revelation. And so in John sixteen twelve, which we'll come to in a couple of weeks, he tells them, I still have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So Jesus is giving them the very highest teaching that he could give them, taking into consideration their own weakness, taking into account the fact that they were slow to believe, that they were limited in what they could perceive because they did not have that Holy Spirit available to them to give them the wisdom and the revelation and the illumination. And that's why when we begin every week or whenever we begin any sort of teaching, I always pray for that Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher and to give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ Because without that, if you don't have that, then you are in the exact same place that the disciples are in here, in the upper room, without the Holy Spirit. He said, Jesus said that he is with you and shall be in you. It's not enough just to have the Holy Spirit with you. The Holy Spirit must be in you in order for you to be able to bear all the things that Jesus wants to. To reveal the fullness of that revelation is what the Holy Spirit comes to bring and enables us, empowers us to comprehend. And that's what Paul is praying for the Ephesians and for the Colossians that you would be able to comprehend with all the saints the height, the depth, the breadth, and the length, and to know. His love that passes understanding, his peace that passes understanding, to experience this, not as a teaching, not as a doctrine, but as a way of life. We also made mention of the fact last time that the Gospel of John is somewhat written in a way that leads us in a steady progression a progression that takes us through the three essential truths and revelations about God, that God is life, God is light, and God is love. And we are going to continue to look at those things tonight in John chapter 14, and actually uh, it's, it's just, it is going to reinforce those three areas for us. A couple of points I want to make before we get into the actual scripture, and uh, it's concerning life, light, and love. We said uh, last time when we introduced these things, uh, we present them and, and you see them on the screen as a Venn diagram. It's three circles that intersect, and there in the middle, all three overlap. And these three circles are labeled life, light, and love. So what does the life represent? Well, it represents the power and the strength of love. Life represents the power and the strength of love. Then there is light, which represents the wisdom and maturity of love. And then love itself represents the great purpose, the reason why. So you can say it like this, that life tells us how, light tells us what, and love tells us why. So with the life of God, how does that work? Well, it all works together. With the life of God, we have the power to serve him. And to serve one another. With the light of God, we have the wisdom and the maturity. Not just to serve 
him and to serve one another, but to know how best to serve. And with love, we have the right motivation. We have the great purpose, the great reason why we serve God and serve other people. And the challenge for many people, as, as we have noted, I've been especially bothered in recent years by something that you would not think would be troublesome or bothersome, but I've been troubled and I've been bothered by many people who seem to be saying the right things and what they're saying is it's all about love. It's just all about love. And it is true that love God and love your neighbor, those are the greatest commandments. But what I have found, and I think if you, if you look at it yourself, I think you'll find this to be true, is that love in and of itself is, by, is not enough. But love needs both the power that life brings as well as the wisdom that light gives. Otherwise, the love that we end up saying that we have for God or the love that we say that we have for one another is a love that is based on emotion. It's based on feelings. And you begin to hear things like, well, you shouldn't judge. You should just love people. You should just love them where they are. And they're the ones that are very quick to jump up and say, well, don't judge. You shouldn't judge. Jesus loves everybody. It's all about love. Just love everybody. And so while that certainly is true, Jesus loves everybody, that's only a half truth. And without the light, without the wisdom to know how to love people, and without the life, the power to be able to, to love them in a way that is not self-centered, in a way that is not carnal, in a way that is not fleshly, in a way that is not emotional. Without that life and without that light, that love ends up being something that falls short of agape. Agape is the God kind of love. It is the unique love that is revealed by God through Jesus Christ, and it is what John refers to when he says God is love. That's the sort of love that he is talking about, a love that is part of the life of God and the light of God. So you need all three, life, light, and love working together. Now, if all you have is light, you might know what needs to be done, but without the life, you don't have the power. You could have the life. You could have the power and the ability and not have the light and lack wisdom. I think that's probably where most of the charismatic movement has ended up today. They have the life. They've got the power. They have the ability. They have spiritual gifts, but they don't have the wisdom. <laughs> they don't have the light. And then, of course, you could have the life and the light. You could have the power and the strength. You could have wisdom and maturity. But without love, it profits you nothing. So I'm not saying love is not important. I'm saying that love is not exclusive. And love cannot operate independently or should not operate independently of God's life and God's light. So we're going to delve into that a little bit more tonight with John chapter 14. And let's begin with my father's house in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now that word mansions there is kind of unfortunate in the King James Version. Because it, it gives people the impression that, first of all, that this is actually what Jesus said. And Jesus spoke in Aramaic. He didn't speak in, in English. And so he didn't say, in my father's house are many mansions. That really does not even make sense. Um, what I believe 
the King James translators were trying to convey with that word mansion is they were trying to convey the idea that there is plenty of room, much dwelling space. And that's really, they could have just said, in my father's house, there is plenty of room. Plenty of room to dwell, plenty of room to abide. Because he's talking about going to prepare a place for us. But when you see that word mansion there, it, it gives it gives a lot of fuel to these fantasies we have. And it even creates songs and hymns and ideas that are kind of strange. Like, uh, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop and up in glory land and so forth and so on. But Jesus isn't talking about heaven. He's talking about a place within the heart of of God, a place that you and I can come together and live in fellowship and communion with him and with his Father. So he's speaking to them of a spiritual reality, a spiritual dwelling place, just like in Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Well, it's not talking about a dwelling place like you've got a little shack on the corner of glory. It's talking about that the Lord himself is your habitation. And so here Jesus is saying the same thing. In my Father's house there is much dwelling space. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, he says. In verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, I want to look at this section, and I'm calling it the path and the purpose of spiritual perfection. We have an advantage as believers. Our relationship with the Lord is intended to be a relationship and not a religion. And that's why we, we say this over and over again, that Our goal, our mission at the School of Christ is to help you discover the freedom and the joy of a Christ-centered faith that is based on relationship, not religion. And so the greatest advantage we have over a religion is that we have the opportunity to enter into a very personal relationship with God that the essence of our faith is not that we are trying to work our way into a place where we can appease God or the gods with our sacrifices or with our offerings. It is not an impersonal, detached God whom we serve or whom we pray to or whom we offer sacrifices to. But instead, we have the opportunity, as Christ-centered believers, to enter into this very personal and deep relationship with the Creator, with our Father. And so the opportunity we have for a personal relationship with the Lord is distinctive. It makes us unique as compared to the typical religion, quote-unquote. But the other advantage that we have is when we are made new creations in Christ. It says, old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And one of the great privileges that we have is that we are on a path that begins with us being in union with Christ. Whereas... Some believe that spiritual 
depth, and spiritual maturity is a lifelong process of working working your way up into this really deep union with God. The mystics of the of the Middle Ages and the the Catholic monks and and those who taught this, you know, they're in the monastery and they're doing the Hail Marys and they're praying and they're working their their way up this ladder to try and achieve this sense of oneness and unity with God, St. John of the Cross. The whole concept behind him and these other mystics of the Catholic Church. It's all about climbing this divine spiritual ladder until you achieve this place after much prayer and flagellation and fasting, you get to a place of unity and oneness with God. But I want you to know that you and I, as ordinary believers, the moment that we come to the Lord and surrender ourselves to him, we begin at the top of the ladder, if I could say it that way. We begin at a place where we are already one with Christ. Paul mentions it in Galatians 2.20 when he says that I am crucified with Christ. That's when we became one with God. We don't become one with God because we go to church, because we pray, because we do all of these contemplative meditations and exercises, and after many years of living in a monastery, we achieve this oneness with God. That's religion. That is trying to work your way into some type of divine favor or unity with the deity. But what Jesus offers us here. He says, I will go and prepare a place for you, he says, and I will come again and receive you to myself. And why? Because I want you to be where I am. And so when we become new creations in Christ, it is all, it all has its beginning in the cross, first and foremost, when we are crucified with him. Romans 6 says that if if we were crucified and if we died with him, then certainly we will be raised with him as well. Then Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2, it talks about the fact that that God has raised us up together with Christ and made us sit together with him in the heavenly places. In Revelation, in writing to the seven ecclesias of Asia, To one of them, John said that he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. See, it's not even a question of working your way up into being seated next to him. The unity and the fellowship and the relationship is such that there is no separation I'm going to prepare a place for you, Jesus says. That where I am, there you may be also. And we see the fulfillment of that. To sit with him in his throne. With him. (laughs) Not next to him. But to sit with him in his throne. That is where we begin in Christ. And so this path of discipleship, it's only taking us deeper and deeper and deeper into this relationship that we already have, this union that already exists. And we'll see next week in John 15, the vine and the branches. You're not a branch trying to work your way into becoming one with the vine. He is the vine and you are the branches. And all you have to do is just stay where he put you. Just remain in me, he says. Abide in me. Continue to dwell in me. And this is the same sense here in John 14. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to bring you and receive you to myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. So you don't have to work your way into it. All you have to do is maintain that relationship. 
continue to live in me. Now, of course, Thomas didn't understand that. He wanted to know, where are you going? And Jesus simply said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The goal is spiritual oneness. The goal is unity. And it's the kind of oneness and the kind of unity and the kind of depth of relationship and communion that a man and a woman share when they are joined together and they become one flesh, Paul says. That's exactly the way it is with Christ and the ecclesia. The path and the purpose of spiritual perfection, the highest you can achieve is spiritual oneness. And so, again, to make the point, this oneness is already yours. It's not something that you have to work a lifetime to achieve. It's already been achieved. It's already been given to you and handed to you. And all you have to do now, according to the Lord, is continue in my word. Abide in me. Continue to live in me. And it's not that you are becoming more and more one. It's just that your oneness is becoming more and more obvious, more manifest. Just as a marriage matures and strengthens, the older it gets, you're just as married 25 years later as you are 25 seconds after you are married. But there's a big difference, isn't there, between a marriage that has gone through the depth and the maturing process of 25 years, 35 years, 50 years. Same two people, but the relationship has gotten much deeper than it was in the beginning. So you can't get more married, but your marriage can get deeper and better. And in the same way, you can't become more one with the Lord because... You are already one spirit with him, Paul says. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, just as certainly as a man and a woman are joined together in one flesh, he says. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And that is the purpose of this path. It's the reason why the Lord came, not just to give us some teachings to follow, but to open a way for us that we can enter into this deep relationship with him. And what is that? It's a love relationship, first and foremost. So Jesus says that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And in this, we're going to see love and light and life all working together. Love represents the way. Jesus says, I am the way. And what is that way? In 1 Corinthians 12, 31, Paul is giving them teaching about spiritual gifts. He's talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the life of the Lord. And then he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Then that takes, that ta- that takes us to 1 Corinthians 13, 1, where he says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Love is that more excellent way. And Jesus says, I am the way. Then Jesus says, I am the truth. And what does that represent? Well, certainly the truth represents the light. The light. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Light represents the truth of God's word. It represents the truth of the Holy Spirit coming to reveal the depths of Christ to us. So love represents the way, light represents the truth, and then life represents the life. That was easy. (laughs) So I told you that you would see love, light, and life, and we see it here in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I've had some people say, well, you know, in what order do these things appear? Is it life and then light and then love? Or is it light, love, and life? Or, you know, it really doesn't matter. We should not think of it in terms of a linear 
progression. It's not that you get really, it's not that you learn how to walk in the light and then you learn how to walk in the life and then you learn how to walk in the love. All of these are working together. When the sun shines through the window of my library facing the east, I'm not dividing up that light into heat and light and ultraviolet radiation. I'm just enjoying the sunlight. And in the same way, love, light, and life working together, we can look and see and give some general, make some general observations about the difference. But in actual practice, in actual reality, these are working together. Well, we can look in this and we see these three things working in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, but we don't consider them separately other than just to acknowledge them and their individual characteristics. Love represents the way. Light represents the truth. Life represents the life. So no one comes to the Father apart from Jesus. In the same way, no one comes to the Father apart from love, light, and life. You have to have the light of the gospel, the light of the Holy Spirit, the truth of God's word, to even know that you must repent and you must give your your heart and all that you are over to the Lord. You must have the life of the Lord for that new creation. You must be born again, Jesus said. You must be born from above, and this is that new life that comes. And then there is the love of God, which we are being conformed on a daily basis as we love God and love one another. These are the greatest commandments, Jesus says. So you can't get to any spiritual place in God apart from this love, this light, and this life. It's with you continually. Because all these things are, they're simply reflections, facets, characteristics of Jesus, as well as the Father, because the two are one. So again, the life, the light, and the love, and we can put that same Venn diagram In front of us, the three circles that intersect in the middle. The way of spiritual perfection is love, truth, and life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. The way is love. The truth is the light, and the life is the life. So that brings us to verse 7 as we consider We've looked at the Father's house. Now we're going to consider the Father's works. So verse 7 says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So these are the Father's works, he says. When we have this relationship this love relationship with him, then there's a unity of purpose and power that comes forth, and it is in this power, this life, and 
And I define that life as the power and presence of God within you and through you to do what you cannot do on your own. And so greater works than these shall you do, Jesus says. And how is that? Well, he explains to them how that's possible. First, he says, consider the union that I have with my Father. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Then he says, if you have heard me, you have heard the Father. So believe me that I am in him and he is in me. And the words that I speak to you are not my own words, but it's the Father who dwells in me. And if you have seen me working, Jesus says, then you should know what's not my works, but it's the Father who works in me. And so what is the significance of that? Well, he just said, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house, and I will return and receive you into myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And so now he says, because I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, Now, just as the Father works through me, so I will work through you. That's how you're able to do greater works than these. Not in your own strength, not in your own power, not in your own life, but coming to me as the way, the truth, and the life. Just as I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and it's the Father working in me, it's the Father speaking through me. In the same way that the Father works through me, I will work through through you. And so if the Father hears you ask anything in my name, it is the same as hearing me ask, because we are one. You see, they were so disturbed and frightened and concerned because Jesus says, I'm going away. And so in their mind, in their heart, they are troubled. He says, don't be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. I'm going away, it's true, but when I return, we are going to be closer than we ever were before. Just as the Father is in me and I am in the Father, so I will be in you and you will be in me. And when you ask anything in my name and the Father hears you, it is the same as if I were speaking because we are one. Therefore, he says, ask anything in my name. And it will be the same as if I am asking, because he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. What a powerful privilege this is. But it is all based on a love relationship. And that's why Judas Iscariot has disqualified himself from the privilege of being able to walk in this fullness. The fullness that you and I have available to us. To live in him, to walk in him, and to see the Father's works in us and through us. This is the life of God, the power and the strength of love. But it comes with a condition, and that brings us to the third section, which is my Father's Word. In John fourteen fifteen, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, Keep my commandments. And so we consider now what it means to really know God and to really be led by the light, the life, and the love of the Lord. The first thing we make note of here in verse 15, and it's been repeated in so many different ways, 
Love is not measured by words. Love is not a feeling. Love is not good intentions. Love is not in our emotions. But love is measured by the things that we do. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. On the other hand, Jesus points out that many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord. And he will say, I do not know you. He says, everyone who hears these teachings of mine and does not put them into practice will be like a man who built his house on the sand. And the waves came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it was collapsed. It fell because it was built on the sand. It's those who hear my teachings, Jesus says, and does them, puts them into practice. They are like the man who built their house, built his house on the rock. And everything came against that house, but it stood because it was built upon a rock. And when they heard him teach these things, the people were amazed at his authority. They were amazed at his teaching. But how many of them actually put those things into practice? So many people just hear the teachings of Jesus, and they think that's all there is to being a disciple. John addressed that, recorded that confrontation there in John chapter 8 that we have already studied. Where even as Jesus was teaching and as he was saying these things, it says that many of them believed on him. And to those who believed on him, Jesus says, if, if, if you continue, if you continue, if you continue, continue, continue in my word. We can't say it enough because it's not said enough. It's not emphasized enough. We live in a time, we live in an age, we live in a generation where it's very easy to be a disciple of Jesus, very easy to pray the sinner's prayer, very easy to walk the aisle and join the church. And delude yourself to believe that you are really walking in the light, really walking in the teachings. So many people believe that they love God. Well, my friends, our love for God and our love for one another is measurable. And for all the people who talk about love, 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 I haven't found one of them yet. who would agree that love is something that can be measured because for them, love is just a state of being. It's just a state of mind. It's just a state of heart. It's just a philosophy. It's just a commandment. There's no practical application. It's all very passive. But this love that Jesus is talking about is very measurable. And he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You say, well, Brother Chip, I just don't believe that love can be measured. It's not for us to measure. It's just something in the heart. It's just invisible. Well, let me tell you something. You can measure love by the behavior of a person. I can measure the depth of love in a marriage by watching how the the husband and the wife treat one another. And in that context of a marriage, we talk about faithfulness, and every one of us knows what it means in the context of a marriage to be faithful to the other person. To be faithful means to be completely devoted to that, to that other person. To love and to honor and to care for and to provide for, and to exclude all others. And my friend, that can be measured. Either you are faithful or you are unfaithful. 
So why is it that we think in our spiritual marriage to God, in our spiritual relationship with God, that somehow faithfulness can't be measured? It's just something I feel. Love can't be measured. It's just something that I feel. It's just something that I say. But The reality is that love is not measured by your words. It is measured by your deeds. And that's why Jesus says the world will know that you are my disciples by the love that you say no, by the love that you have, that you show to one another. Paul said that the fruit of the Spirit, first and foremost, the very first thing he says is love. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, and fruit can be measured. Fruit is observable, just like faithfulness is observable. Love is observable in a marriage. How could it not be so in your relationship with God? Love is not measured by what we say. Love is measured by by what we do. And our lack of love, our lack of faithfulness is observable as well. So Jesus says, if you love me, and how many people say, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, they love Jesus. Oh, he really loves the Lord. Well, there's a way to test that. I'm not not saying go out and test everybody else. Test yourself. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments. And here's the interesting thing. In verse 16, he says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you again. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. So we could say it like this, that the Holy Spirit that Jesus promises here, the Spirit of truth, the Helper, he says, is really a reward for the faithful. He is a reward for those who love him and who keep his commandments. The Holy Spirit is given. Ephesians 1, Paul refers to the Holy Spirit as the earnest of our expectation, the earnest of our redemption. It's like a a small deposit of future glory to give us a glimpse and a taste of the powers of the age to come. The Holy Spirit is not given to the world, Jesus says. The world cannot receive that Spirit because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. But that is the wedding gift, so to speak that the bridegroom offers his bride. Then we come to 21, verse 21. And again, we're going to see the light and the life and the love repeated yet again, like this threefold cord that winds its way through the entire Gospel of John. And even here in this very chapter, we see it presented to us again. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. There it is again. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. If you call me Lord, Lord, then you will do the things that I say, Jesus says. It's very simple. Continue in my word. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will continue in my word. But here is the light and the life and the love all over again to to teach us once more. Having his commandments means knowing what they are. And how do you know what they are? Because of the light. Having his commandments is the light. 
having his commandments is the light. The Jews had the commandments. The law was given by Moses. And the Jews had the light. They knew what God wanted. They knew what God expected. But in Romans 7, Paul says the light is not enough. Having his commandments is not enough. Paul says, I agree with the law of God. I agree with the commandments that they are good and holy and just. The problem is not with the light. The problem is that there is something in me that prevents me from doing what I know I should do. I delight after God in my inward man. I see the light. I know what God wants. But there is in me, in, in my members, he says, another law at work. That the good I would do, I don't do. And that which I would not do, that I end up doing. Who will deliver me from this bondage? The very thing that was intended to give me life actually killed me, Paul says. Because I have the light. I've got the revelation, but I don't have the life. I don't have the power to live according to what I know. And that's the whole problem with the Jews. They have the light. They have the commandments. They have the testimony. They have the revelation, but they don't have the life. They don't have the power. They don't have the ability to please God, to obey God, to serve God. That was the entire indictment of Christ to the Jewish leadership. Whitewashed tombs. They don't have the life. And the interesting thing is you cannot shine light on a dead person and bring them back to life. Light can only do so much and light cannot raise anyone from the dead. You cannot shine a spotlight on a corpse and bring that corpse back to life. Again, we see it takes the light and the life and the love working together. So Paul has the light in Romans 7, but he's frustrated. Who will deliver me? And then in Romans 8, we see the deliverance. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, he goes from the commandment which brought light. Now he's talking about life overcoming death, and that's what we need. So having his commandments here, In John 14, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, and keeps them, that means they have the power as well, the life working together with the light. Can you see this? Can you see where you come up short if all you have is the light? All you have is the teaching. All you have is the doctrine. You could even have the word of God. But even the word of God, even the very word of truth, did not profit them, it says in Hebrews, because they did not mix it with faith. And what that means is they didn't have the faith to step out on that truth and actually apply that truth and experience the life of God in a practical way to be able to live according to the light. That's what it means to walk in the light. It's to live in the light and to experience the life and the power of God to enable us and to strengthen us to do what we know needs to be done. We know what needs to be done because of the light. If you don't know what needs to be done, then you need the light. That's where we go back to the Word of God. That's where we rely upon the Holy Spirit to give us light. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. So the light shows us the way, but the life gives us the power to walk in the way. Isn't that good? It's so simple. It's so profound. 
He who has my commandments, that's the life, and keeps them, that's the life. It is he who, here it comes, it is he who loves me. And he who, see how it leads to the love? And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. You see how this just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Having and hearing is the light. Keeping and doing is the life. And all of this leads to perfection in love. Being made perfect in love. That's what it all is leading to. All three of these working together, the light of God, the life of God, and the love of God leads us to the full knowledge of Christ. The full knowledge of Christ, the Greek word is epignosis. When Paul says, my goal is to know him and the power of his, resur of his resurrection, and Peter says, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. These words for knowledge to know, the word is epignosis, and it means not just knowledge, it means full knowledge, complete knowledge, mature knowledge, perfect knowledge. And it's not the kind of knowledge that you can obtain by reading a book, going to church, listening to teaching, or even reading the Bible. It's the kind of knowledge that can only be obtained by experience. It's the experience of knowing Christ and how you do that by walking in the light. Walking in the life and walking in the love of God, which leads us into this deep experiential knowledge of who he is. Because Jesus promises, he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Too many people trying to get a knowledge of God as a thing, as a factoid, as something to be studied, theology, the study of God, instead of experiencing the life, the light, and the love of God. So in verse 22, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other Judas, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Their expectation was that the Messiah would reveal himself to the world and would rule over the nations from Jerusalem. So they were still looking for this outward fulfillment of a messianic kingdom. Jesus is teaching them of a spiritual kingdom that is within it's very intimate, very personal. And Jesus answers in, in verse 23 and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Here we are for the third time now. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Same word. I go to prepare a place for you in my father's House is much dwelling space. Here, Jesus is repeating the same promise. We will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. You just cannot get away from this, my friend. You cannot get away from the responsibility you and I have. If we say we love Jesus, we must continue in his word as disciples. If not, we're going to go the way of Judas. We'll follow him up to a point until we decide we don't want to go into this life, light, and love relationship anymore. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. I mean, it's very plain, it's very simple, it's very sobering. Without these three working together, the light that tells us and shows us the way, the life that empowers us to walk in that way, and love, which keeps our heart right, and our motives pure, 
Without these three working together, there is no depth of revelation. There is no depth of knowledge. There is no manifestation of the fullness of Christ in us. We just end up following a Jesus that we invent. Someone that is merely a figment of our own self-centered imagination. God created in our image. And that is religion. That is death. That is darkness. And that is love, but it is love of self. It is not love of God. So again, the Venn diagram with three circles converging in the center. Circle number one has the word. That's the light. Keeps the word. That's the life. Knows the word in the sense that we don't just know the commandment. We don't just know the written word. We know the living word. And that living word is the Lord himself. Knowing the word is love. So again, you see the life, the light, and the love working together. You can also illustrate it with this chart of progress, John's threefold revelation. We've seen it before. Again, the order does not so much matter. It's just these components working together, leading us down a path. The life, the light, and the love. It's the way, the truth, and the life. Love being the way, light being the truth, life being the life. (laughs) And what does that lead us to? The way, the truth, and the life leads us to the Father, Jesus says. Well, in the same way, he repeats it again, just saying the same thing in different words. The life, the light, and the love leads to spiritual maturity, this oneness, this perfection. Not in the sense of sinlessness. That's not what Scripture means by perfection, because only Jesus is perfect in the sense of being sinless. We are made the righteousness of God. We are not actually the righteousness of God. All we have to do is look at our sins and our mistakes and our shortcomings. And John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We're not sinless. We've been made the righteousness of God. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, but in ourself. That's a different story. So perfection means maturity. Perfection means that we have reached the purpose for which we were created. And that purpose, my friends, is to love God and to be loved by him. That is perfection. That is spiritual maturity. And this is the path. Life, light, and love. Walking in all three of these. For God is all three of these. Well, then we come to some very practical concerns since Jesus is leaving them for the time being. And he's trying to reassure them that this is all very good. This is all working according to his father's plan. This is all very necessary. So we come to the final section that we will consider tonight. My father's help. Beginning in verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, You would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. 
I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Even in this, and this isn't in the slide, it's not in the notes, but I'm just telling you in verse 31, even in this we see the life, the light, and the love. That the world may know that I love the Father, there's the love. And as the Father gave me commandment, there's the light. So I do, there's the life. You see it? There's the three, that threefold cord working together. Hallelujah. So the Father's help, seven promises here that I want to share with you, seven very practical promises from the Father to the faithful. And by this we know by now, hopefully you, you've you been paying attention and you know what is meant by faithfulness now. Faithfulness in our relationship with God. It is measurable. It's the demonstration. It's the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. It's the measurement by which we prove to ourselves that we really do love the Lord because we are faithful to our relationship with Him. So there's some help that we get to enjoy here. Seven practical promises from the Father to the faithful. Number one, we are promised the eternal help and aid of the Holy Spirit. He will be with you forever, Jesus says, to help and to guide, for he is the Spirit of truth and he is the helper and the comforter. That's the second thing. We are promised the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why we don't have to be afraid. That's why we can be in peace because we have a peace that passes all understanding, the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, our counselor, our guide. Number three, he promises the full teaching of the Holy Spirit. Remember he said, or he will say in John 16, that I have many things to say, many things to teach you, but you are not able to bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into all truth. Here he sets the way for them again. He says, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he promises to lead us into the fullness of this revelation, as well as, number four, he promises the spiritual mind of the Holy Spirit. And what is that? Well, it it is the spiritual mind to bring to your remembrance, he says, all things that I have said to you. Who do you think brings back to your remembrance the things that Scripture teaches or the things that Jesus says? Who is revealing not just new things, but bringing to your remembrance things that you have already had revealed to you that maybe you forgot? So the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth and he will bring to our remembrance everything that Jesus said and did and taught. We are promised, number five, the peace of God. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. We are promised the very presence of Christ spiritually. When he says, I'm going away and coming back to you. Coming back in what sense? Well, in both senses, that's number seven. The future hope of his return, because I believe that both apply for us to really enjoy and benefit and rejoice in the presence of the Lord. We should have hope and expectation, not only to enjoy the spiritual presence of Christ, in the form of the Holy Spirit living within us, but we also have the hope of his return. The hope and the expectation and the promise of the prophetic scriptures and his own word himself 
that he will come again and receive us unto himself. And he will rule and reign over the nations with a rod of iron. So to recap everything that we have discussed tonight, first and foremost, in my Father's house, Jesus shows us the path and the purpose of spiritual perfection through himself as the way, the truth, and the life. The way is love, the truth is light, and life is life. Secondly, we learned in my Father's works that Jesus shows us the life of God, his power working in us to do mighty works in his name. In my Father's word, Jesus shows us the light of God, that the Holy Spirit is sent to bring us revelation and bring to remembrance everything that he has said. That is the operation of light. And in my Father's help, Jesus shows us the love of God, that his ultimate desire and will is to make himself fully and completely known to us and to never leave us alone. So this entire chapter is structured around life, light, and love. Jesus, we have seen, is the only way to the Father. For in Christ, in him we see the perfection of light, life, and love. And we find that these qualities, once deposited into his followers, are increasing with the increase of Christ in them. As the Holy Spirit leads us more deeply into the light of truth, and as we are obedient to the light that we have, we experience the life of God in ever-increasing measure doing in us and through us what we are unable to do ourselves. The end result? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit reveal themselves in an ever-increasing fullness, and the very love of God is shed abroad in our heart. It is by this love that the world will know that we are truly his disciples. If you'd like to find out more about the School of Christ and how to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at www.theschoolofchrist.org. 